Before we begin, we'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. We're here in Brisbane, so we gracefully acknowledge the Yuggera and Turrbal people as the traditional owners of this land. We recognise it was Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander land and sea. It always was and it always will be. Welcome to our TEDx Sydney Discovery Session, Transforming Economies to Serve People and Nature. I'm Ashley Morris. And I'm Janie Morris. And we are the co-founders of Corio. We lead a very small team, catalyzing a very big impact when it comes to accelerating the transition to a circular economy globally. And we would love to fast forward you on a journey from our dysfunctional linear economy to the beautiful possibility of our future economic system, the regenerative circular economy. So let's dive into the economy. There are these two young fish swimming along and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other direction who nods at them and says, morning boys, how's the water? And the two young fish are on for a bit and then eventually one of them looks over at the other and goes, what the hell's water? You may be asking yourself, what does this parable have to do with our economy? Well, there's definitely something fishy about the way we're using finite resources as though they're infinite. And we are hooked on consumer capitalism, whether we like it or not. And by 2050, there's going to be more plastic than fish in the ocean. But the point of the parable really is that we're too busy to notice that the water we are swimming in is drowning us. Spoiler alert, the linear economy is reaching the end of the line. Business as usual promises us, us a social contract whereby if we work hard, we earn a good wage, we buy ourselves a lifestyle and come to possess assets that we can pass on to the next generation. This economic model has been very lucrative since the Second World War. So we work harder, faster, holding on to the idea that our big payday is just around the corner. Then and only then will we get to stop and smell the roses. We are burnt out, wired up, plugged in and feeling down. The harder we work, the more we consume, the greater resources we burn through, the further away we are from being able to stop because we are part of the production line. The linear economy, it's not outside us, we are inside it. We are stuck in the machine driving this thing. Our hunger for something more is innate, it's natural. But our response is programmed for consumption. More stuff, more things, more plastic toys for all. Shiny new things prove we are doing well because deep down, we are sure that's us that's the problem, not the system. And while wages stagnate, productivity is increasing, house prices are soaring and the cost of living is going up. But the system is not working for us. We are working ourselves to the bone for it. Business as usual, it's bad business. When we realize the balance sheet is weighted against a balanced world. David Foster Wallace used the fish parable to address the graduating class at Kenyon College. His speech is now one of his most popularized pieces. In it, he argues gorgeously against the unconsciousness, the default setting, the rat race, the constant gnawing sense of having had and lost some infinite thing. Let me ask a simple question. Do you feel as though you are living in an economy that serves you or one that you live in service of? Our linear economy is the rat race. It's the gnawing sensation, the driver of everything that makes us feel like we are asleep at the wheel. Spoiler alert number two. Our linear economy is hurtling towards a dead end. By 2050, the global population will reach nearly 10 billion people and our systems will start to collapse. Why? We are wasteful. Globally, 91% of all raw materials are wasted after their first use. We are unproductive. Australia extracts and uses 38 tonnes of primary resources per capita each year. That's doubled the OECD benchmark. However, we only generate one US dollar and 28 cents of output for every kilogram of material consumed, less than half the OECD benchmark. We are unimaginative. Resources go in and waste comes out. But remember, no material ever leaves our biosphere. They just change form depending on how they are valued. We are unaware. Every year we extract almost 90 billion tonnes of finite biomass, fossil energy, metals and minerals from our Earth. Even if the Earth's entire history was squeezed into one year, humans have existed for only 37 minutes and already used up one third of the Earth's natural resources in the last 0.2 seconds. 
If you've been paying attention recently, you will have heard our linear economy described as a take, make, waste model. But what does that actually mean? I'm going to start a business. Making what? Making money, of course. How? Well, credit is cheap. I'll start producing products. So you'll be in debt to a bank? Yes, but energy is also cheap, so I'll be able to produce more stuff. So you'll be in debt to the natural world? Yes, but waste and pollution, they're handled by other people. So it doesn't really matter for my business. So you're in debt to other people? Yes, but again, other people love our products, so they will buy them and forget about the environmental, social and financial cost. So you're indebted to people forgetting? Yes, but remember, people are so used to forgetting that remembering is really not a threat. They cannot remember a time when they had less than what they need, so having much more than what they need seems nothing less than normal. BAU, or business as usual, so they say. So the linear economy is watertight. We need to consume because we are consumed by need. And while we're inside the linear economy, we can't see it. Like an unconsciousness, a default setting, a rat race. The linear economy keeps us on the straight and narrow. Take, make, waste, repeat. We're so busy trying to make money out of the linear economy, we don't stop to think about whether or not it makes sense. Let's take a look at the context of the system we're in. In the linear economy, natural resources are extracted. These natural resources are then made into millions of products using cheap labour. This process effectively converts natural and social capital into financial capital. Tax breaks on fossil fuels means cheap energy for powering stuff. An offshore labour market and social inequality mean cheap labour for making stuff. A credit lending system favouring business means cheap money for buying stuff. Built-in obsolescence in scarcity marketing cheapens our need to buy even more stuff. A governance structure which internalises financial capital and externalises erosion of social and environmental capital enables the consumption to continue. Economic growth relies on a highly complex system, the take, make and waste of stuff. But the linear economy is coming to the end of the line. Cheap energy is depleting finite natural resources. Cheap labour is being replaced by robots and depleting social well-being. Cheap credit is throwing everyone but the rich into lifelong debt. Cheap products are creating so much waste that environmental and biodiversity loss is collapsing the ecosystem. The not-so-cheap campaign donations to government deplete policymakers' desire to legislate for polluter pays or producer takes responsibility laws, allowing profit to be made at all cost. The system is costing us the earth. It's costing us our mental and physical health. It's costing us our future. The social and environmental price we are paying for financial capital is simply too high. And as consumers, we bear the responsibility for the waste, the pollution, the social discontent. If you're anything like us, you may be feeling incredibly overwhelmed with the pickle that we've just presented. We get it. In our experience, we've discovered that the linear economy is one of those things that once you know about it, it's really hard to unknow. So sorry about that. But perhaps like us, you're also a little curious. Let me tell you a story about two sisters and curiosity. In 2017, curiosity was the catalyst for Janie and I to come together to experiment with a new economic model. I was 28 and an environmental health scientist. I had spent the previous five years working on some of the world's most intractable environmental issues, from the rising burden of e-waste to deforestation in Indonesia. And I was 29 and I had just left my role as a remote area nurse. I had worked in some of Australia's most impoverished communities, addressing health inequalities whilst trying not to get eaten by crocodiles. I shared with Janie that throughout all of my professional experiences, I only ever felt like I was putting band-aids on the symptoms of the problem and never tackling the problem itself. No matter how much money, time or goodwill was invested, forests were still being cleared, orangutans were still being burnt alive, children were increasingly suffering from e-waste related lead poisoning and traditional communities and their precious cultures were still being lost. It was at this point in the conversation that I interrupted Ash's reverie and asked her quite bluntly, what are you going to do about it? You see, we grew up with the philosophy that when you know better, you do better. So it made perfect sense to challenge Ash. Plus, I've always been an advocate that actions speak louder than words. Feeling a little defensive and very passionate, I launched into a full-on assault of our current economic model and triumphantly declared that the antidote to our current economy was, could be found in the circular economy. 
one in which we design out waste and pollution, we keep products and materials at their highest value for as long as possible, and we can regenerate our natural world. Sounded pretty good, right? I, of course, now was feeling like I had won this challenge, but in the very next breath, Janie very characteristically rolled her eyes and asked me what the circular economy looked like in practice. You see, despite understanding the circular economy at a theoretical level, the problem was that no matter where I looked in Australia, there were no tangible examples of how to take the circular economy from theory to practice. So when Jenny challenged me to do something about it, I challenged her right back. What are you gonna do about it? Ash and I are extremely competitive and also both quite stubborn. A year apart in age, a centimetre apart in height, yes, I'm the taller one, and a point apart in any sport that we play. Needless to say that when challenging each other to take the circular economy out of theory and put it into practice, it's no surprise that we egged each other on to the point of agreeing to put our lives on hold for six months while we worked for free, climbed in bins, picked up thousands of cigarette butts, fought with the local council, cold called small businesses, and so, so many more fun activities. Idiots. <laughs> you see, on that fateful day in March 2017, we launched Australia's first systems-based circular economy project, aptly titled The Circular Experiment. For six months, we worked with 45 small businesses on one city street to implement a range of different circular economy concepts. Things were tangible to the businesses at the beginning, like energy, water, waste. But gradually, over the course of that six months, as we built trust and rapport, we started working with the businesses on things that were a little bit more intangible, like logistics networks and asset sharing. Over the course of the six months, we delivered 22 different projects, including diverting all of the food waste to a local commercial composter, creating a closed loop coffee grounds project with a local farmer, designing out single use plastic straws, undertaking an energy audit to reduce one restaurant's electricity bill by 40%. We undertook a campaign to reduce cigarette butt litter by 60%, which saw us collect over 4,000 cigarette butts, a business to business asset sharing platform, a water refill station, partnering to divert all of the soft plastics away from the street, and many, many more projects. Together, we created an environment built on trust and collaboration that helped unlock economic opportunities for the street, whilst reducing the business's environmental impact and building social capital. Fundamentally, the circular experiment was a success, and as such, it was no longer an experiment. It's Corio. Today, Corio is a dedicated circular economy consultancy, taking the circular economy from theory to practice globally. We deliver tailored solutions designed for transformation over transaction. For example, right now, we are designing Australia's first circular postcode with Lendlease called Yarrabilba. To give you an idea of scale, Yarrabilba will have 11 schools and be the size of a regional city on completion. We are empowering Rio Tinto's global board to understand the value of the circular economy. We are working with L'Oreal to introduce circularity across their four key pillars of operation. We are on the ground with Hydro Tasmania, Sustainability Victoria, Queensland Health and the Queensland Investment Corporation, optimising their supply chains and their strategies to move towards circularity. We're working with Dexas, Fraser's, Stockland, Charter Hall and Mervac on taking the circular economy from theory to practice in the built environment. And we work alongside Fortescue, BHP and Anglo-American to reimagine the heavy extractive industry to a regenerative resource development industry. Most days, the possibilities of the circular economy blows our minds before breakfast. And people are catching on. We've been invited to speak at the UN General Assembly on the circular economy. We've also both been appointed as adjunct professors of the circular economy at Griffith University. Not bad for two sisters who on the 17th of March, 2017, Googled how to start a business and then winged it from there. In the powerful words of Barack Obama, change will not come if we wait for some other person or some other time. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the change that we seek. At this point, you may still be wondering, what the Dickens is a circular economy anyway? The circular economy isn't any one thing, nor can it be realized by one policy, one project, or one narrative. Imagining the circular economy is like staring at a reflection of our better selves a mirror of possible solutions to the complexity of the problems we find in the world today. Okay, so that was really poetic, <laughs> but for real, what is it? 
It's a restorative and regenerative economic model made up of three practical ideas. The first is designing out waste and pollution. The second is keeping materials at their highest value for as long as possible. Third is regenerating natural and social systems. Okay, so sit tight. We're going to teach you about Circular Economy 101, the butterfly. The circular economy distinguishes between technical and biological materials. Biological materials, things like cotton, food and wood, they're treated as nutrients in a circular economy. These materials need to be returned to regenerate our natural systems, things like our soils, which then provides renewable resources for the economy. On the other hand, technical materials such as steel or oil-based plastics, they're treated as hard durables that need to be recovered and restored through strategies like reuse, repair or remanufacturing, but in the very last resort, recycling. The tighter the loop, the less value that slips through our system. As powerfully stated by a global thought leader, Dame Ellen MacArthur, the circular economy isn't about one manufacturer changing one product. It's about all of the interconnected companies and governments that form our infrastructure and economy, coming together and rethinking the operating system itself. But what's the size of this opportunity? A circular economy will address 45% of global greenhouse gas emissions and abate 165 million tonnes of carbon pollution each year in Australia. That's equivalent to every single person in Australia flying to New York and back and there again every single year. A circular economy will unlock the value of the 91% of raw materials that are wasted after a single use. That's a whole lot of jobs created too. Saro has modelled that the circular economy will triple job creation in Australia from resource recovery. A circular economy is a $4.5 trillion opportunity globally. And this year, PwC valued the circular economy at $2 trillion over the next 20 years for Australia. A circular economy will also help address the 90% loss of biodiversity associated with the extraction and processing of natural resources. Now, for those of you who have heard about the circular economy as recycling on steroids or as another waste management strategy, or worst again, sustainability dressed in a skirt, let us bust some myths for you. Myth one, the circular economy is all about better waste management. Yeah, nah. In a circular economy, waste is eliminated through better design rather than developing novel ways to utilise waste that has already been created. It focuses on upstream innovation and not better waste management. There is a clear distinction between designing from waste and designing out waste. Myth two, the circular economy is just about recycling more. Oh, well. The focus of a circular economy is on maintaining products, components and materials at their highest possible value for the longest possible time. This can be achieved through reuse, repair, refurbish and remanufacturing strategies. Recycling is part of the circular economy, but it represents the loop of last resort when all other options have been exhausted. Say it with me, folks, recycling is not the answer. Myth three, efficiency is the answer in the circular economy. That's a negative. Traditional sustainability efforts have focused on efficiency tactics. It's true. Reducing the amount of material and energy used in production, therefore aiming to lower environmental impacts. But a strategy focused on reducing the negative impacts of our activities or making them more efficient can only go so far. We need to ensure systems are effective, not just efficient. Remember, it's not about doing less bad, but rather doing more good. Myth four, so the circular economy is just a fancy word for sustainability. Wrong again. The circular economy is a fundamentally different vision for our economy, pretty much in direct opposition to the incumbent take, make, waste linear model. It focuses on industry-led transformation and systems level change, drawing inspiration from nature rather than from individual action or guilt like sustainability. It is about designing differently from the outside rather than mitigating and reducing the impacts of something that has already been created. Essentially, we're not looking to sustain a broken system. We're looking to completely reimagine it. Myth five, the waste to energy technology of mass incineration is part of the circular economy. She went there. Controversial because in many countries, mass incineration or the burning of waste like plastics to produce energy 
is viewed as a valuable pathway. But let me be clear. Mass incineration isn't part of a well-designed system. For example, in the case of plastics, taking an energy source, oil, and turning it into an important material using more energy, which is then used for a very short period of time, only to then use more energy to turn it back into another form of energy, is not an example of a high value process. There's also increasing evidence that waste energy plants can lock cities, regions, and even countries into needing a steady flow of waste to make those plants economically viable. Essentially, you need to feed the beast. You're creating a demand for waste rather than designing it out. So the question is not why move to a circular economy, it's why not? The circular economy comes alive through shared value and shared value creation. And shared understanding is the powerful multiplier that will scale this opportunity. That's why we're here talking to you. Here's the three most important calls to action that you're going to take away and share with people that you care about. Number one, leadership, the multiplier. We need to elect women and underrepresented people to parliament. A regenerative economy will never be legislated by the old white men benefiting from an extractive economy. Cognitive diversity at the decision-making table will redistribute financial, social, and environmental capital more equally. Leadership is the multiplier because shared understanding will scale shared value. Number two, tax, the divider. We need to rewire our fiscal machine to ask at what cost. We need to stop internalizing profit whilst externalizing cost. We need to stop taxing businesses and individuals and start taxing resources. We need to demand transparent reporting from individuals and businesses that ruthlessly correlates value with cost. Tax is the divider because a sole focus on fiscal wealth will divide our society. Unless we take profit and divide by social and environmental and financial cost as one equation. Number three, innovation, the plus. Opinions are the cheapest form of knowledge. We need to stop judging and start fostering new ideas. Celebrate trying and failing. Be the weird kid who thinks outside the square. We need to create collective safe spaces for leaders to try new things and fail. Convergence innovation comes from uniting disparate ideas and materials, creating systemic solutions to systemic problems that are more than the sum of their parts. Imagine if we're able to create an economy that serves people and nature rather than one that people and nature serve. That's what we're working towards. How about you?